Welcome back to Chapter 3, Part 2 of Anatomy Physiology 1. So when we left off in the last episode, we were talking about all the organelles that you find in a typical cell. And I thought this was kind of neat, where somebody took a cell phone and put in the various um, organelles. Now, what I really find funny is nobody out there probably who's watching this has even seen a telephone like this. So this is clearly an old cell phone. But anyway, I like the analogy. I think it's funny. So you have the ribosomes, which are on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You have mitochondria. You have the plasma membrane. Here's the Golgi apparatus that is blebbing off and making vesicles. You have smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And you have the cytoskeleton. We didn't really talk about the cytoskeleton in the other picture, but you do have all of these proteins that are holding the cell in shape. So I kind of, uh, in my mind, I look at a tent. So if you looked at a tent, it'd be laying on the ground. But if you take those poles and you put the poles up, you'll make the tent shaped the way you want it to be shaped. And that's what a cell does. Because if you took all of the proteins out of it that do the supporting and make the scaffolding and the skeleton inside, then it would just be, it would just be flat. So um, we need those proteins to give shape to the cell. And one of the things that we didn't talk about in the other picture was a lysosome. So one of the things that a cell has to do is digest things. Just like when you eat stuff, you have to digest it. You have to send it to your stomach, and you have to mix it with acid, and you have to have it go into the small intestines, and you have all kinds of enzymes. It'll break down the proteins into amino acids, break down the carbohydrates into sugars, and the fats into smaller fats. So how do you do that if you're just one cell big? Well, what you do is you take the digestive enzymes and you put them in a lysosome. You put them in one of the bags, like the ones that the Golgi apparatus makes, and it protects the cell from being eaten. So if you were to rupture the lysosome and release those enzymes, it doesn't care. It's, there's no brain involved. It's just going to start dissolving any proteins that it comes get across or any of the carbohydrates that it runs into. So you're going to literally eat the cell from the inside out. So I kind of call these doomsday machines. So if you hurt me, I'll hurt you back. So if you pop the lysosome, then you release all those enzymes and you pretty much... Uh, caused uh, a lot of damage, if not irreparable damage to the cell. I'm showing you this picture right now, but I actually should show you this picture at the end of my talk because it's kind of a, an overview of everything that we know about the inside of the cell. And what they've done is they've used electron microscopes, of course, but they've also used x-rays, They've used MRIs, CAT scans. So all of the things that we have in our arsenal that allow us to see very, very tiny stuff, we've used. And they've come up with this composite picture. It says, how much of this can you identify? Well, I can start right here because I see a desmosome that's like the Velcro. Remember the proteins I said that hold two cells together? So here's one cell membrane right here, and here's another one, and they're being held together by this protein. And then we have the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So here I can see the endoplasmic reticulum, and I see the little ribosomes that are on the surface of it. I'm coming down here, and I know this is the nuclear envelope, and what gives it away is it has large pores. So here are the pores for the nuclear envelope or nuclear membrane if you want to call it that and I'm not sure what's passing from the 
cytoplasm out here into the nucleus. But something clearly is coming through the nuclear pore or exiting the nuclear pore. Can't really tell which way it's going. So that one, I don't know. I wish I had a key that told me what's going on. Here you probably have either a microtubule or you have the centrioles. Since there's two of them, I'm going to go out on a limb and say those are the centrioles. Here are some of the proteins that make the scaffolding, the whole of the cell, in, in its shape. Here is a mitochondria. What gives the mitochondria away is it kind of looks like a peanut a little bit, but it has this membrane, the folds, and we'll learn about the cristae and we'll learn about how that the ATP is made. And it has its own DNA because it's a bacteria, and bacteria have their own DNA. So there's some of the things that I see right away that are really kind of cool. The next thing that we're going to talk about is the cell surface. So here is the desmosome holding two cells together, but here you can see the cell surface, and what we're going to do when we zoom in even closer is see that this is a double layer of fat. So here's a double layer of fat there, and here's a double layer of fat there. And we're going to call it a phospholipid bilayer. So it's not just lipid, but there's phosphate attached to it, and we'll find out why that's important. And it's a bilayer, meaning there's two layers of it. So we'll look at that. And if you look, here are all sorts of proteins all over the surface. They're kind of floating along in a sea of fat. So we call it the fluid mosaic. And what makes up the mosaic are these proteins that are floating around. So a lot of students, when I talk to them about mosaics, they don't even know what I'm talking about. They've never made mosaic uh, ashtrays or cookie dishes or whatever in uh, Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts. But that was one of the things we used to do in the day. You take little pieces of ceramic and you glue them in a pattern, and that would be a mosaic. So somebody looked at the surface and said, oh, it looks like a mosaic. So we'll call it the fluid mosaic. So here's our summary slide. It says, as we go along, we're going to learn about second messenger systems. And we're going to see things that stick out of a cell, like the microvilli, the cilia, and flagella. So most of you are familiar with the flagella because you've seen a sperm before. So it's got that long tail that whips along. But a cilia is kind of like a flagella, only it's a lot shorter. And we'll be definitely looking at those. They're going to be really important in the respiratory system. And the microvilli you're going to find in the intestines, and they allow you to absorb food. So they increase surface area. So the plasma membrane is also known as the cell membrane or the cell envelope, some people call it. But it is the outer covering, and it holds the cell together. That's its function. And we talk about the intracellular face and the extracellular face. So you've got the side of the membrane that faces the cytoplasm inside the cell, and then you have the outer face, which is uh, facing the interstitial fluid or the extracellular fluid. So we're going to learn about how the cell gets rid of waste. It just dumps it through the membrane into the outside. So in the extracellular space, you're going to have waste. And we have to deal with that. We have to get rid of those wastes. So we learn about that when we do the lymphatic system. What else do you do with your cell? It, def it defines the boundaries, we said. But it also causes you to have interactions with other cells. And one of the examples that just jumps to mind right away is normally when a cell bumps into another cell, they both stop growing. They're like, okay, there's already a cell that I'm touching, 
So I'm not going to go any further. I'm not going to divide. I'm not going to get bigger. I'm just going to stay put and do what I need to do as a cell. But if you have a cancerous cell, they lose this contact inhibition. So they'll bump into a cell and they don't care. They don't even, they ignore the existence of the other cell and they go ahead and divide. And so now they're actually crowding out the other cell or crushing the other cell. They're stealing the food that should have gone to the nearby cells and it will continue to grow and continue to grow. And we call this tumor formation. You're making a tumor. So cells should talk with each other, but cancer cells lose that ability. And so they just divide every chance that they get and they end up making uh, tumors. The other thing you can do with the cell is you have to have stuff moving in and out. Again, we talked about waste. You don't want to poison yourself by filling up your inside with waste. So you've got to get it out. Just like you have to go and poop every day. They have to get rid of their waste. And then you've got to bring in foods. And if you're in charge of like making insulin, then you're going to have to get the components that you need to make the insulin so that you can make it and then you can release it. So uh, there are, we'll, we'll definitely spend some time talking about how things get in and out of cells. This is an actual picture of a cell membrane. And if you look, you can see there's one layer right here and there's one layer right here. So this is the uh, extracellular and this is the intracellular side of it. And here you have your nuclear envelope and it is also a phospholipid bilayer. So you're going to find that most of the stuff in your cell actually is phospholipid bilayers. So what is a phospholipid bilayer? Well, of course, you know, I always have to have a joke. So here's my joke. If you take a triglyceride, so do you remember back when we talked about triglycerides, you take a six carbon sugar and you break it in half with enzymes, and then you hang a fatty acid off of each one of the three carbons that you have. So you had six carbons, you broke it in half, and now you hang a fatty acid off of each of the three carbons. That's a triglyceride. Now, a triglyceride is a fat. It will not dissolve in water. So in order for me to make my cell membrane, that's not the best choice. So what you're going to do to make your cell membrane is you're going to take off one of the fatty acids. You just have an enzyme that will take one off, and it's going to replace it with a phosphate. So now you have two fatty acids, the three carbon, half of a sugar, and then you have a phosphate. Phosphates like to dissolve in water. So now you have a molecule that is hydrophobic. These fatty acids will not dissolve in water and they will try very, very hard to get away from water. And then you have the phosphate end that likes water and will dissolve in water and hang out in water quite happily. So it's hydrophilic. So anyway, here is a phospholipid saying, I think I'm fat. And then I found another cartoon that I put on the same slide that I thought was interesting. And here's a girl asking at a donut shop, or a pastry shop, what do you have with no fat and no sugar? And the girl says, you can eat the napkins, because that's about the only thing we have with no fat and no sugar. But we know that the napkins are made from plant material, and we know that actually the fibers that make up the napkins are almost pure sugar. But remember, it's put together in a way that we can't digest it. So you could eat the napkin, it, you would not get any fat, and you would not obtain any of the sugar. You will have eaten a lot of sugar, but you can't break it down.
So this is the slide we looked at in the chemistry chapter, and now we're looking at it again in the cell chapter because if you make bonds, here's a sugar bond up, here's a sugar bond down, sugar bond up, we don't have any enzyme in our body that can break that down. So this is what the napkin would look like if you looked at it under a microscope, and it's made of sugar, but in a form we can't break down. So we call it roughage, it's cellulose, we call it fiber, so that's some of the names it goes by, but it's actually cellulose. So anyway, I thought that other cartoon was interesting because she's right that there would be no nutritive sugar in there, but she's wrong because napkins are made of sugar. So here is an artist concept of what the cell membrane looks like. So this is like a cartoon drawing. And you're going to have channels that allow things to move from one side of the cell membrane to the other side. You can have proteins that are so large they stick all the way through the phospholipid bilayer. So there's a part of it sticking up out here and a part of it sticking down here. You're going to have peripheral proteins on the outside and peripheral proteins on the inside of the cell membrane. So peripheral just means it doesn't go through. And here you have glycoproteins. So here's the protein part right there. And if you look, those are little sugars sticking up. And these glycoproteins are going to be interesting because they identify you as you. So if you look at the glycoproteins on you, they're not going to be the same as the glycoproteins on me. And that's going to be important for, like, if I try to get your kidney, you know, I need a kidney transplant, and you're kind enough to offer me one of your kidneys. If we don't match up, then my body will just go and say, well, that doesn't belong to you, and they'll just destroy your kidney. So that's one of the problems you have with transplants. You need to have as much of this outer stuff matching between the donor and the person who's receiving the um, organ. If you haven't done this, you should sign your driver's license. There's a place on it. Now, I haven't seen the new driver's license that we have to get in order to travel, but there was a place on the old ones, and you could sign it, and if something happened, you're in a car wreck, something horrible happens, uh, you could donate your body. So if you, they just look at your driver's license and see, oh, good, this is an organ donor, and they can use your eyes, and they can use your kidneys, and you know whatever wasn't uh, damaged in the wreck that did you in. One more thing I wanted to point out before we leave this slide. Here are proteins. So these are fibrous proteins like this. And they make up the cytoskeleton because, again, this is a layer of fat. So how are you going to support the fat? Well, you're going to make a, a network or a scaffold of proteins that they can rest against. And they determine the shape of the cell membrane. So we're going to see some of the tricks that you can do with these proteins to change the shape of the cell membrane. And one last thing that I forgot to point out that was important. Look at this. See this little blue thing right there? It didn't look like chicken wire. Here's another one that looks like chicken wire. So part of the phospholipid bilayer, besides having proteins embedded in it and glycoproteins, you've got cholesterol. This is cholesterol. So almost every last bit of your cell membrane is a lipid, 98%. 75% of it is going to be phospholipid, and a lot of it is, again, you've got cholesterol in there, so you're going to have that embedded in there too. So I just get so frustrated when I hear people saying, oh my God, cholesterol is so bad, you've got to cut it out of your diet. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you are so ignorant. You need to take a class in anatomy, physiology, or biochemistry. So I think this cartoon kind of sums up what's going on with a phospholipid bilayer. So if you just have these phosphates, 
right here, the phosphate ends, which will dissolve in, in water. And then you have those fatty acid tails hanging off that will not dissolve in water. This is why you end up with a phospholipid bilayer. This is why it forms in two layers. So this can face the fluid outside the cell, and this can face the fluid inside the cell. And the fatty acids hang out with each other in the middle, and there's no water in here. There's no water. So here is one of the phospholipids with a water gun saying, Hey, look, I have a water gun. Ha, ha, ha. So you don't want any water in between these layers. It's just fat only in that area. So he brought a water gun in, and they're all trying to get away from the water. So on the other slide, it said that most of the cell membrane is fat or lipid, and a lot of it, most of it, is phospholipid. But cholesterol is really important in making up the cell membrane. And then about 5% of the uh, lipid is, um, has sugar on it also. So we looked at the glycoproteins right here. So here's a protein with sugar on it. So we call it a glycoprotein. Glyco means sugar containing. And now we're talking about glycolipids. So you have fat with sugar on it. Well, we know that a triglyceride already has half of a sugar molecule along with its fats. So you can also put other sugars on the glycolipid. So on the cell surface, you're going to have a lot of this uh, sugar coating. <laughs> it's kind of nice. Your cells are sugar coated. The glycocalyx or the carbohydrate coating on the surface, the outer surface of a cell. If you had a microscope and you were staring at the cell surface, you would see a protein bob up and then disappear. It'll go back down. Or you'll see it over here and then it floats through the phospholipid bilayer and ends up over here on another area. So the proteins that are in the phospholipid bilayer, most of them are moving around from place to place. But you do have a few of them that are actually locked into place because they're anchored to the cytoskeleton underneath. So uh, it would be kind of interesting because the cell surface is very dynamic. There's all sorts of cool things going on. So this is just a cartoon picture kind of showing you what I just said. Some of the proteins are anchored with the cytoskeleton that's holding the shape of the cell. And then some of them have sugars on them and some of them don't have sugars on them. So what can we do with these proteins that are floating around or anchored in the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane? Well, some of them are receptors. Some are second messenger systems. That's the second time we've talked about that. So we're about to tell you what those really are. Some of them are enzymes, so they break things up, down or put things together as they enter or exit the cell. There are the channels that we showed you a picture of a channel where something could move through the channel. And there are carriers that will float like a, a ferry boat from one side of the membrane to the other. And they'll ferry things across through the, the hydrophobic center of the phospholipid bilayer. Cell identity markers, this, the things I told you about that identify you as you. And then cell adhesion molecules. So we saw some of those like the desmosomes and the hemidesmosomes, and we're going to learn about gap junctions and other uh, things that you have in your cell membrane. So here's a cartoon picture showing here's a channel allowing things to move through so they don't have to touch the fat. They can stay inside this protein and slide on through. Here's an enzyme. It's taking something and it's breaking it up into little pieces. And here's a receptor. Now, I want to spend a second talking about receptors right now because they're super important right now. One of the things about COVID is 
it specifically looks for a receptor, and that receptor happens to be in a high concentration in the lung cells. So if you did not have a receptor, I could spray you with virus, and it would not hurt you, it would not affect you in any way, because viruses cannot enter a cell unless they are invited in. And the way they're invited in is with a receptor. So if we can get this COVID virus to mutate where it no longer binds to the receptor, then it can no longer go in the cells. Or even better, if we find something that will coat the receptors, cover them up, then when the virus comes along, the spot where it was going to attach and then be pulled into the cell is already blocked. But the kind of the problem with that is we need those receptors. We put those receptors out in the phospholipid bilayer because we need them. So your lung cells are rich in what we call ACE2 receptors. So ACE2 is short for angiotensin converting enzyme. And when we do the renal system and when we do the endocrine system, we'll learn a little bit more about what angiotensin is and angiotensinogen, things like that. But what we need to know is this is the thing that allows the COVID to come into our cells. So if we could block that uh, receptor, then there's no way that the COVID could get into our cells. And we wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. So that'd be nice. When we do the nervous system and the muscles, we're going to talk about gated channels. And we're going to talk about these entryways that are going to be letting some things in and some things out. And then we have active pumps, which I don't see that on this particular set of proteins. But they will actively pump ions out and pump other ions in. So we'll talk about the pumps that are there. And here's the uh, identity. So not only does this have to match up if you're going to get a transplant from somebody, but it also, you can look at this and you can tell who the baby daddy is. One of my students sent me this, and I had never seen it before, and I really thought it was awesome. So here's a couple of people in jail, and one of them receives a box that has transport proteins in it. And he opens the box, he walks over to the cell wall, and he walks through the cell wall because he got transport proteins. They'll take you through the cell wall. This slide kind of summarizes some of the things I was talking about. And I talked about some of the channel proteins. Some are always open. Some are open only under certain circumstances. So there are some of them that only open if something binds to them and forces them open. Another kind of channel protein will open if electricity is run through it. and It'll cause it to open. And then others are mechanically gated, and if you just stress the cell, then it's going to open it up, and it's going to try to equilibrate and relieve the stress. So as I said before, when we do nerves and muscles, we will come back and talk about this in great detail. Some of the proteins are going to bind with something that's on one side of the cell membrane, and it's going to ferry it across to the other side. So these are doing what we call facilitated diffusion. So some things like gases can just diffuse directly through the cell membrane. They can go right through the phospholipid bilayer. But in this case of facilitated diffusion, it goes across from high concentration to low concentration, but it requires a transport protein to get it past the hydrophobic tails of the fatty acids. The next two slides are a short summary of second messenger system. And the guy won the Nobel Prize for figuring this out. So it's, it's really cool and it's really important. But 
uh, we're just going to lightly touch on it in this class. So here's the cartoon version, and it shows you a protein. And this happens to be a receptor for what we call the first messenger. And so in this example, they're using epinephrine, which you and I call adrenaline. So here comes this molecule, and it binds to the receptor, and it causes the receptor to move through the phospholipid bilayer and dock with a nearby protein. So it's going to move over here. It's going to touch this one. And as it's doing this, the, the uh, receptor has the first messenger on the outside, but your reaction is going to occur on the inside, inside the cell membrane. And you're going to have a protein that's going to take ATP. It's going to pull two of the three phosphates off, leaving you with AMP, and then it's going to make it into a cyclic compound. So cyclic AMP is the second messenger. Now, you start with one molecule and one receptor, and you end up with a lot of cyclic AMP. And the cyclic AMP is then going to go on. It's going to turn on an inactive enzyme. And so now this is activated. So you have this kind of a cascade, and it's multiplying. So one molecule starts this whole chain reaction. You get a bunch of these. You get a bunch of activated kinase. And then the kinase um, is an enzyme that takes phosphates off of ATP and puts the phosphate on other molecules. In this case, the kinase is actually turning on enzymes that are turned off. So here we have cyclic AMP turning on inactive kinase, making it active kinase. Once it's activated, it starts pulling phosphates off of ATP and putting them on certain proteins that it is programmed to do so and turns them into activated enzymes and then you get all kinds of chemical reactions going on inside the cell. So you have this huge cascade. This thing never even came in the cell. It's, it just went onto the receptor on the outside and started this whole avalanche of things going on. Alright, so here is the slide that kinda says it all in words. So we saw the picture and here you go, epinephrine binds to the surface, which activates the G protein. Uh, the G protein, the guanosine triphosphate, is going to cause the adenylate cyclase to turn ATP into cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP turns on the, the kinases that are in the cytoplasm. And kinases add phosphate groups to other enzymes, which turns some of them on and turns some of them off. So up to 60% of all the drugs that you take work through G proteins and second messengers. So they actually don't even enter the cell at all. They just turn the cell on. So there's a lot of words here. You should know about ATP, and it has three phosphates. You should know that enzymes can be turned on or off by adding a phosphate group to them. You should know that the first messenger is something that binds to the receptor outside, and the second messenger inside starts the cascade inside the cytoplasm. So those are the things that I want you to take away from this. If you want to memorize all of this, that's fine. There are other second messengers besides cyclic AMP. And if you take a biochemistry course, you'll learn some of the others. But this is one of the uh, most important ones. It's uh, one of the first ones that was discovered. And, and uh, so anyway, there you go. The sugars that you have on the outside of the cell, here's a whole list of things that, that it helps you. Defense against cancer, that's a nice one. Transplant compatibility, if the sh uh, sugars that are attached to the proteins don't match up, then the odds are that your immune system will destroy whatever it is, which is good if it happens to be an invading worm uh, or 
malaria or something like that, but kind of sad if it's the heart that somebody just donated to you or the liver that somebody or whatever. Um, it is important in fertilization. You don't want every sperm to get through. You just want some uh, one sperm to get through only. So it's important in that. Um, it's important in cell adhesion and so on. The next two slides are talking about microvilli and if you're in the intestines, the object of the game is to get as much of the food, as much of the nutrients as possible from the food before it passes out in your uh, fecal mass. So people with diarrhea often die because they can't absorb enough nutrients fast enough because the food is passing too quickly through their intestines and on out of their body. So it's always kind of interesting. I ask my students, I said, what's the number one killer in the world? And they're like, oh, cancer, heart attacks, things like that. And I just look at them and I said, not in America. What's the number one killer in the world? And then they stop and think. It's diarrhea. Isn't that odd? In America, you probably never met anybody who died from diarrhea. But worldwide, if you don't have hospitals, if you don't have IVs, if you don't have antibiotics, uh, it's quite easy to die uh, from diarrhea. So the cells that line the small intestine have villi, or villi as some people call them, or finger-like projections that stick out into the lumen of the intestine. So here's a picture so if we cut through your intestines and look down the middle of it, you have all these little finger-like projections coming off. So the food is going to have to percolate through these finger-like projections, and that gives you a chance to grab the carbohydrates, the sugars, the proteins, the amino acids, the fatty acids, the cholesterol, all the good stuff that you need to absorb to keep your body going. And then on each cell that lines the villi is the microvilli. And what they've done is here's your cell membrane right here. Here's your phospholipid bilayer. But the cell has actually made proteins and stuck them up through the membrane. So what you're looking at here is a protein that's stuck up through the cell membrane. And it causes the cell membrane to move with it. And so now you have increased the surface area even more. So here's a cross section showing you the little proteins. I always say it looks kind of like somebody just grabbed a handful of spaghetti and stuck it up through there. So when we talk about the digestive system, we'll definitely come back and talk about this. There are two other bundles of long stick-like proteins and one of them is found in the cilia if you just have one cilium that you're looking at here is the cilium it whips forward that's your power stroke or excuse me whips backwards and then it kind of sneaks back so it does it low and then whips back again and then sneaks back so you have a power stroke and then the recovery stroke. Cilia are used for moving things along. So when we do the respiratory system, we'll talk about mucus in your uh, windpipe, in your trachea. And you have cilia in your, in your nose, but they don't wiggle. They just help you with uh, smelling things. And then a flagellum, instead of having a power stroke like this, they're more um, wiggling their way along. And the only flagellum that you have in the human body is in a male, and it's on his sperm. Women don't have any of those. Other uses for cilia, where we're going to be talking about them again, it helps with balance in your inner ear. You have little rocks called otoliths 
that balance on these little hair-like projections. It helps you in, in uh, seeing things, smelling things, moving the egg along so that it makes it to the uterus so that it can implant and you can be pregnant. Here's a cartoon version showing you the bundles of proteins that make up the cilium. And here actually is a real picture showing cilia inside of your body. They've done it with an electron microscope, which only is black and white, and then they've colored in the cells purple, and then you can see the cilia, the, the green. One of the main things that you do with cilia is you move mucus along. So when we do the uh, respiratory system, when we do the excretory system, the digestive system, we'll be talking more about the mucus and the goblet cells that squirt it out so that the cilia can move it along and clean out areas. Here's a video that I found of a camera that they stuck down somebody's throat. Here you see the cilia beating, you see a layer of phlegm, of mucus, and you see white blood cells and other things that you've sucked into your lungs being passed along. Cystic fibrosis is a hereditary disease where you are unable to pump saline out onto the cell surface in order to have the cilia working. You're going to have thick amounts of mucus and they're going to fall down into your lungs. So one of the things that people with cystic fibrosis have a problem with is in the mornings when they have to have someone literally beat on their back to break up the mucus so that they can cough it up so they can go through the day and get enough air. And it this mucus is other places in the body, so you're going to have trouble uh, getting enough nutrients. And this is a very sad statement at the bottom, the life expectancy of 30. But way back when I very first started teaching classes like this, uh, people didn't live to be out of their teens. So this is great. I mean, it's horrible that you die at 30, but it's a whole lot better than dying before you even make it out of your teens. So I'm pleased that we're making some progress. And they're looking at a genetic um, gene therapy where they replace the defective gene with one that works correctly. So I have my fingers crossed that we can actually cure this one. We seem to be close Another thing the cell can do is it can take those uh, long linear proteins and push them up against the cell membrane and the cell will move in that direction. And so if you keep pushing, the cell will continue to move in that direction. And so you can actually have cells crawling around in your body. This is a picture taken inside of a blood vessel. And what you're seeing right here are white blood cells that are crawling towards the source of an infection. So wherever there's an infection, you're going to have chemicals released, and it, it summons these. So here they are doing what we call diapodesis, or crawling along. Here's a picture I took when I was in graduate school. Uh, one of the girls had a yeast infection, and so we put some of the yeast from the yeast infection on a slide and then we put a white blood cell on there and watched it crawl over and it's reaching out and it's going to pull the yeast in. This yeast is budding so it's pulling the baby and the mother in to be eaten and you can see it's reaching out for these others. Those extensions are called pseudopods or fake feet. And white blood cells do um, phagocytosis, where they literally take the cell membrane and wrap it around something and pull it into the inside. 
This happens to be a polymorphonuclear leukocyte, or a PMN for short. And when we do the immune system, we'll talk about PMNs. Here's a cartoon I thought was kind of funny. Uh, so here you have cilia on the outside of this cell. And she is talking to her husband and saying, I'm talking to you. You're so, you're so thick membraned sometime. Our next topic is called membrane transport. And we're going to get into osmosis. And to me, it's really straightforward. It's really easy. But somehow or another, Students get lost. They get tangled up trying to figure out what's going on. What's the tonicity? Who's hypertonic? Who's hypotonic? Who's isotonic? What's going on? So hopefully I will give you enough explanation, enough um, mental images that you won't get confused. So there's a variety of ways to get things through the membrane. Some things just diffuse across. So if there's more on the outside than there is on the inside, it'll start flowing into the cell. If there's more on the inside, it'll start flowing out. So you always have gradients with diffusion, and it goes from high concentration to low concentration. This works for filtration, diffusion, and osmosis. Now, there are ways, if you have more stuff outside, but you want even more stuff outside, you can use ATP energy and force it to go through the membrane and outside, even though there's already a whole lot outside. So you can go against the concentration gradient, but only if you use ATP energy to do it. You have to have some energy source to force it to go against the um, diffusion gradient. From time to time I'll throw a video link in and I won't test you over this but it's kind of fun to watch this particular video so I just threw it in there. The other thing I like is here's your phospholipid bilayer. So here are all your phosphates. You have a sea of phosphates and then you've got your proteins floating out in that um, um, fluid mosaic. And then here are all of your hydrophobic acetic, uh, sorry, fatty acid tails that are hanging down. Later on when we do the circulatory system, we're going to learn about specialized capillaries that allow filtration through the walls of the capillary. So capillaries are kind of leaky and we want them to be. We want stuff to be able to come in through the walls and we want things to be able to come out through the walls or the membranes. But you uh, have even more leaky in the kidneys because you want more to leak out there. So we'll talk more about that. But filtration, if you want to get a mental picture of what filtration is, just go in there to your coffee machine, put in a filter, put in your coffee grounds and run water through it and what comes through the uh, filter is coffee and the grounds stay behind so filtration just think of coffee filters and you got the whole concept if you want a mental picture of simple diffusion get yourself a beaker or a glass of water and put some kool-aid in it cherry kool-aid grape kool-aid something that has a nice color and as you watch it it's going to swirl through the water and it's going to be at a high concentration as you pour it out of the packet but as it goes into the water you can see it slowly diffusing out until your whole glass is pink or purple or whatever color kool-aid that you just threw in there so simple diffusion if you can see uh, Kool-Aid dissolving in water. You got the whole concept of that going on. High concentration to low concentration. A lot of this is common sense. You've seen this since you were a kid. If you warm something up, you're going to make it diffuse faster. So, classic example there. Get a warm glass of tea and a cold glass of tea. Put a teaspoon of sugar in the hot. 
stir it, it's almost instantly dissolved. And you're sitting there with the cold iced tea, trying to get that teaspoon of sugar to dissolve, and you're stirring and you're stirring and you're stirring, and you're still seeing the sugar laying there on the bottom of the glass. So the warmer the liquid, the faster the diffusion to where you reach equilibrium. So you have the same amount everywhere. You don't have a high concentration and a low concentration anymore. Molecular weight, the bigger something is, the hard it is, harder it is to diffuse. And that kind of makes sense. So a mental picture there, get a package of sugar and put it in your tea and stir it. And then get a sugar cube. I don't know if you've even seen sugar cubes anymore, but back in the day, that's the way they served it. And you just take it out with a pair of tongs. They didn't have little paper packages of granulated sugar. But it's very hard to get a cube of sugar to go into solution. You really, really have to stir it or have very warm uh, water that you're making your tea or whatever. So the bigger it is, the harder it is to get it to diffuse. The faster diffusion goes if you have a really high concentration of something. So if you have a low concentration and you're trying to diffuse it, it's going to take a while. But if it's really, really concentrated, you can see it uh, reaching equilibrium a lot faster. The, if you're going through a membrane, of course, if you've got a larger membrane, if you've got more surface area, then you're going to get the diffusion to happen a lot better. Now, I can give you a really disgusting and sad example of that. People who have emphysema have replaced a lot of their lung tissue with scar tissue. So when they breathe in air, they don't have as much surface area. They don't have as much active lung tissue as someone who does not have emphysema. And so they're not going to be able to diffuse the oxygen into their bloodstream and the carbon dioxide out like they need to. So you're going to actually have to enrich their oxygen so that you can get it to diffuse into their bodies. So... Emphysema is, is quite often caused by not using protective mask when you're working with stuff that's going to destroy your lungs and, of course, smoking. And it is a horrible, horrible way to die. From time to time, we're going to run across a concept, and I'll just stop and tell you, you got to know it. Don't go on. And if you don't understand it. So if you don't understand gradients and diffusion, you need to back up and go back and understand high concentration to low concentration until it makes sense to you. Now, osmosis is super important. It explains so many things that are going on in the body. So if you don't understand it after I go through it, back up this video a little bit and go back through it again or go out on YouTube and have somebody explain it to you. But you really have to know osmosis. It's, a, it's as important as something like homeostasis. You have to know what homeostasis is. So in the case of osmosis, you're going to have some sort of a membrane. And since we're talking about the human body, the membrane is going to be a, a cell membrane. So you want some stuff to go through the membrane and other stuff not to go through the membrane. So let's, let's just stop and take a moment here to look at what is inside the cell. Well, you've got all the organelles that we talked about, the endoplasmic reticulum and the ribosomes and mitochondria. You've got all of that stuff inside the cell. You have salts, sugars, amino acids, proteins, hormones, DNA, again, more stuff inside the cell. And then outside the cell, you also have stuff. You've got waste products that have been released. You have um, food that's been leaked out or filtered out of a capillary. And so it's going to be coming over to the cell. You've got hormones. So you have things outside of the cell also. Now, if the amount of stuff outside the cell equals the amount of stuff inside the cell, it doesn't have to be the same 
thing. It doesn't have to be the same sugar. It doesn't have to be the same salt. Obviously, it's not going to be DNA because DNA is inside the nucleus and it's not outside the cell. So you're going to have to have the same amount of osmotic stuff on either side. Otherwise, the cell is either going to get really big or really small. Now, if I were to take a patient and hook them up to an IV of water, I would kill them. It, that, would, that would kill them because you can't do that. What you're going to be doing then is you're going to be diluting the stuff that's outside the cells. And the result of that is that the water will rush into the cells and literally blow the cells up. So we don't ever start IVs of water in somebody, even though you're saying, well, they're dehydrated. You know, they've had diarrhea and they're, they're just so dehydrated that we just got to give them water. Well, you can't do that. You can give them water with salt in it, which we call normal saline. You can give them water with sugar in it. So you can give them glucose or dextrose. And then we have all kinds of IVs that you can give them, uh, uh, ringers, lactate, all kinds of things. Whatever they're needing in their body, you can put in their IV. But you have to have the same amount of stuff in the fluid in the IV as you have in the patient's cells and interstitial fluid. So the word for that is isotonic. You have to have an isotonic IV or you'll end up killing the patient. So there's a few things summarized on this slide that they're important. Water is what's going to be moving through the membrane. If you have a lot of stuff inside the cell and not very much stuff outside the cell, then the water outside the cell will rush in to try to dilute the inside of the cell so that you have the same amount of stuff on both sides. If on the other hand, you have a whole lot of salt or sugar or protein or something else on the outside of the cell, so you have a hyper situation where it's like, there's so much stuff out here, that it will actually suck the water out of the cell to try to dilute the stuff that's outside the cell. So the water is going to go wherever there's the most stuff and try to dilute it. So don't get tangled up in what the stuff is. Some of the results of osmosis gone wrong would be diarrhea. So instead of absorbing the fluid out of the lumen of the intestine, you actually keep putting more fluid in there and it washes out the uh, food before you have a chance to get the nutrients from it. Or in the other case, if you don't go to the bathroom and you leave the fecal mass in your rectum too long, you'll actually suck all the water out of the uh, fecal mass and it will dry up and then you can't pass it, so you're constipated. And it gets too large and too hard to pass through the anal sphincter. If you've ever seen anybody who stands on their feet for a long period of time, or if you're ever on an airplane and you watch the people getting off the airplane, a lot of the people are going to have swollen ankles. And that's called edema. So these are some of the things that happen if osmosis doesn't work correctly. Another thing is you can't make urine. Osmosis is very, very important in making urine. And if you can't clean your body of waste, then you've only got a day or two to live. So super important that you understand osmosis because we will be talking about it in many of the chapters ahead. Here's a cartoon representation showing uh, side A, you've got some stuff, and it doesn't specify what the stuff is. And then on this side, you have more stuff. And then there's a 
semi-permeable membrane, which means it's got enough space for the water to go back and forth, but it doesn't have enough space for these molecules, whatever these, this stuff is. It can't move across. So if you look at this, over time, the water will move out and over to the other side, trying to dilute the stuff on the other side. Now, this is a horrible picture, but anyway, that's what we have. Here's something you've probably done at home, or if you haven't, you ought to try it. If you've got celery that's gone all limp and weird in your refrigerator, and you're like, ew, or you've got carrots instead of nice and crispy crunchy carrots they're kind of you know bent over and shriveled up a little bit and you think man i just need to throw this away there's they're no good well what you've done is you have sucked the water out of the carrot or you've sucked the water out of the celery and so it shrivels up so what you can do if you have limp carrot or limp celery is just stick it in a glass of water that's it if you stick it in a glass of water, there's more stuff in each of the cells of the celery than there is in the glass of water. The glass of water doesn't have really anything in it except for maybe a little bit of chlorine, a little bit of fluoride, if you live in an area that has fluoridated water. So you got not as much stuff outside so what's going to happen is water always goes and tries to dilute the side of the cell that has more stuff. So in this case, it's going to force itself into the cells of the celery. And there you go. You have a nice crisp stalk of celery again. Here's a cartoon that you may find amusing. It is a cell that had too much sodium inside of it. And because it had too much sodium, that's stuff, it started taking water in, trying to dilute the sodium. And so here's the cell that's teasing him and saying, wow, you're looking really swell today. Been hitting the sodium hard. And the cell says, that's not very funny. Here's another osmosis joke that I thought was funny. Osmosis is the diffusion of molecules from a place of higher concentration to a place of lower concentration until the concentration on both sides is equal. So here's a cat slowly going across until they have about equal amount on each side. This is the correct definition for osmosis, but unfortunately, it's one of the reasons why a lot of students get osmosis completely confused, unnecessarily. They're talking about the diffusion of molecules from a place of higher concentration. Well, the molecules they're talking about in, in uh, osmosis is water. So they just should say, it's the diffusion of water from a place of high concentration. Well, if you have a glass of water, that's a high concentration of water because there's not a lot of other stuff in there. So that's kind of a hard concept to get. So the water is what we're looking at. We're not looking at other things. So water is going to go where there is more stuff. I think that is a little bit easier to understand than diffusion of molecules from a place of higher concentration to a place of lower concentration until the concentration on both sides is equal. I think this is another reason why students have so much trouble with osmolarity and osmosis is because the dissolved particles, which I just call stuff, we, we measure it in its ability to pull water. So we talk about osmoles. And you also have to look and see whether or not the solute ionizes in water. So glucose doesn't ionize. It's held together by covalent bonds. But sodium chloride 
is able to ionize in water. So it splits into sodium and it splits into chlorine. So it counts as two molecules. So it is two osmoles per liter. So when you get into stuff like this, it's like, uh, I think I'm just going to go ahead and turn my mind off because I'm never going to be able to understand all this stuff. So don't do that. I'm going to get you through this, I promise you. So your body has all kinds of chemicals. And so the osmolarity is just the osmotic concentration of all the stuff. So where's more stuff? Is there more stuff inside the cell? Is there more stuff outside? And again, it doesn't matter if it's glucose, sodium chloride, DNA, ribosomes. It doesn't matter. It's just where there is more stuff. So because our body is at homeostasis, most places in your body are going to have about 300 milliosmoles per liter of stuff. So you're going to have that in your plasma so that your red blood cells don't blow up or shrink. You're going to have it in your tissue fluid so that you don't have your tissue swelling up and you get edema, the swelling that you get in your tissues, or shriveling up. If you've ever looked at your hands when you're dehydrated, your fingertips are all wrinkly. So that would be the osmotic pressure causing your fingers to wrinkle like that or your ankles to swell because again the water will always go in the direction where there's more stuff so basically throughout your body you're going to have about 300 milliosmoles an exception to that is in your kidneys because I want to filter out and so in your kidneys you'll go up uh, over a thousand milliosmoles but we'll talk about that when we get to the kidneys. I'm an older person, and so I've lived through generations of all sorts of, of uh, ways of saying somebody looks nice. So you can say, oh, they're really buff, or they're really groovy. Or I think one of the terms that they're using now is they have good muscle tone, or they're very toned. So we're going to talk about tonicity in relation to osmosis. So if you've got more stuff, we say you are hypertonic. If you have less stuff, we say you are hypotonic. Okay, hypertonic, more stuff, hypotonic, less stuff. So water always goes from the hypotonic area to the hypertonic. And if you're successful, then you'll have the same amount of water and stuff on either side. It may not be the same stuff, but the osmolarity is the same. So you're at equilibrium. And if this is true, we say you are isotonic. So you can't have hypertonic without having some places hypotonic nearby. And your whole body, with the exception of your kidneys, pretty much should be isotonic. So they use words like a hypertonic solution has a higher concentration of non-permeating solutes. Okay than intracellular fluid. What the heck are they saying? Well, you've got stuff inside the cell that is, it can't get out. So it's non-permeating stuff. All right, so here's an example. You have about 300 milliosmoles of stuff inside of your red blood cell. This is what a normal red blood cell looks like. It's kind of got a dip in the middle where it's thrown its nucleus away so that it can put more hemoglobin in there. This is what a normal red blood cell would look like. So in the plasma that's outside, you're going to have the same amount of stuff as you have inside. And so the water's not going to rush in or rush out. 
So it is isotonic. Now, if you put the red blood cell in a hypotonic solution, meaning there's not as much stuff outside the cell, then what's going to happen is the water is going to rush into the cell and try to dilute the hypertonic inside. So the hypotonic outside will rush in, try to dilute the hypertonic inside, and as a result, the cell will swell up. And if you continue leaving it in there, it'll actually blow up. So you'll end up uh, breaking your red blood cells, and then you can't carry oxygen anymore, and uh, you'll die. And a tragic case that comes to mind there was a, a couple who had a child, and they did something wrong, as children do, and they decided that they were going to wash the evil out of the child. And so what they did is they made the child drink a glass of water, and then he had to drink another glass of water, and then he had to drink another glass of water, and they forced the child to drink so much water that it diluted the fluid outside of his red blood cells and it ended up killing the child so they actually killed their child by forcing him to drink so much water that it diluted the inside of him tragic but they didn't know any better and they just thought that they were washing his evil away and didn't know about hypertonic and hypotonic if you are drinking too much caffeinated stuff, it's going to cause you to pee out too much of your fluid. So a lot of people, especially around test time, they're just drinking one caffeinated drink after another, and then they wash it down with a cup of coffee and a Red Bull and maybe a no-dose or something. And the end result is you've got so concentrated fluid because you're peeing out your water but all the other stuff remains in your body so now you have hypertonic fluid outside of your cells basically you're dehydrated because you peed out too much and so what's going to happen is the water will be sucked out of the cells because remember, water always goes in the hypertonic direction. It goes where there's the most stuff. And because you aren't drinking fluids, you're just drinking caffeinated beverages, your cells will literally shrink. So what you're looking here, these are the things that hold the shape of the cell. But because you're sucking in or excuse me, sucking out the water, it's pulling in the cell membrane. So you can actually see the proteins sticking out. So when you see a, a bumpy looking cell like this, you, you call it crenated. The word is crenated. And it means that you've, you're dehydrated and you've sucked the water out of the cells. And obviously this cell is not going to function correctly. So one of the things that happens when people get dehydrated is a lot of times they get disoriented. A friend of mine had the flu and was so sick she couldn't get out of bed to get water to drink. And she knew she needed something, but she didn't know what it was. And so when they went to check on her, she was literally walking down the hall or stumbling down the hall, banging into the walls. So as soon as they got fluids into her, not water, but fluids that were isotonic, uh, she, she came, she was okay, she was fine. But had they left her for too much longer, then um, she probably would have passed away. She was, she was very close to having her kidneys shut down. I'm going to give you one last visual so that hopefully once and for all you've got osmosis burned into your brain. One of the things we used to do as a kid was go out with salt and sprinkle it on the slugs because the slugs will eat your tomatoes, they'll eat all your plants, and they leave these slimy trails all over everywhere. So that was one of the jobs my mother sent us out to do. Well, if you pour salt on a slug, then on the outside of the slug is more stuff 
than on the inside of the slug. And so what happens is the water that is inside the slug is pulled out to dilute the salt. Water always goes in the direction of hypertonic or where there's more stuff. And so it literally will shrivel the slugs up and they can no longer function. So a little sprinkle of salt on a slug will kill it by osmosis. The facilitated transport that I was talking about, also known as carrier-mediated transport, or the ferry boat, where you're carrying things from one side to the other, again, you're going with a concentration gradient. So you're going from high concentration to low concentration. But the important thing on this slide that I wanted to point out is you can only carry as much as you've got carrier transport proteins. So if you've only got 10 of them, you can only carry 10 molecules. If you've got 100, you can carry 100 molecules. So you can saturate it. So even though you've got more on the outside than you have on the inside, you can only just carry so much of the protein or whatever it is inside the cell. So one of the things that people don't understand about type 2 diabetes, they think that the people who have type 2 diabetes don't make insulin. Well, that's the people who have type 1 diabetes. They've actually destroyed the part of the pancreas that makes insulin. So type 2 diabetics make the insulin, but they lack the receptors that bring it into the cells. As we get into other chapters, we're going to find that these ferry boats can take one thing across, like calcium, or it can take two things at the same time. They call it co-transporting or symporting. And sodium and glucose is an example where both are carried across the membrane at the same time. And then antiport, so symport, same direction, antiport in opposite directions. Wherever you're bringing sodium across, you're putting potassium on the other side. You're basically exchanging sides. So the sodium-potassium pump we will talk about in several chapters. So just carry one thing, carry two things at the same time, carry two things, but one goes in one direction and one goes in the opposite direction. And then you can either carry things with the diffusion gradient and you don't need energy, or you can go against the gradient and you've got to have ATP energy. You have to have some sort of an energy source. As I mentioned before, we're going to talk about the sodium-potassium antiport where you're taking one, one, way and one the other, but this is a surprising fact. Half of the calories that you use every day are used just to keep sodium potassium on the correct side of the cell membrane. Half of your calories. That's kind of amazing. Two things that the sodium potassium pump does that are important is it charges your muscles and charges your nerves. So they actually have an electric charge across them. I've had this video for decades. You can kind of tell by the hairstyle and if you saw the clothes. But here is a guy and they've hooked him up with electrodes and he is connected to an electric train set. So there's no batteries involved. It's just this guy using his sodium potassium pump, his ATP energy, and he's actually going to power the train. I hope by listening to my videos that you don't just try to memorize things like uh, sodium potassium pump functions 
to maintain negatively charged resting membrane potential. Instead, I'm hoping you're going, wow, by pumping in sodium and potassium to opposite sides of the membrane, you put an electric charge on there that you can actually measure with an oscilloscope. You can measure it by charging up an electric train and making it run. These are not my PowerPoints. I borrowed them from the textbook. But one of the things they tell you when making PowerPoints is don't put too much on a slide because whoever's trying to watch the slide, their eyes will roll back in their head and they will stop listening when they see that much information. So I'm going to try and go through some of this. Vesicular transport. You can pinch off the cell membrane and you can send stuff into the cell or out of the cell by pinching. So this is instead of like just one receptor and one thing binding to the receptor, for example, the, the ACE2 receptor that allows the COVID virus to attach to it and then it pulls it inside the cell, whereupon the virus takes over the machinery of the cell and forces the cell to make copies of the COVID virus. So that's just one uh, molecule, that's just one virus. But if you have a whole area where you got a whole bunch of sugar, you got a whole bunch of something that you want to pull into the cell, you can actually pinch off a chunk of the cell membrane and pull the whole thing in at one time. And there's something called clathrin, which can coat the surface of the cell and a lot of stuff will come and attach to the clathrin and after you've got a lot of stuff attached to the clathrin then that part just pinches in and we call that endocytosis because it's coming into the cell and I bet you can figure out what it's called if you take waste or maybe a hormone that you've made or some proteins that you that you've made that you need to get outside of the cell. You take the bag that's made of a phospholipid bilayer, push it up against the cell membrane, which is the phospholipid bilayer. The fats join together and you release the contents outside the cell. So that's exocytosis. So bringing it in, endocytosis, bringing it out, exocytosis. And you use little proteins so in my mind, I kind of see uh, something inside the cell with chopsticks and it's kind of pushing against the cell membrane and causing it to, to close off. So you have little proteins in there that are helping these bags to form, these vesicles to form. So endocytosis, bring a big bunch of stuff inside like a bacteria. Bacteria are, are really large compared to you know, the size of a cell. So that's a mouthful to bring a whole bacteria in. Here's a cell right here. And you can see where these bacteria are outside the cell, but the cell is bringing them in and digesting them. So cells can eat bacteria, but they do it by endocytosis or some people call it phagocytosis. If it's a big mouthful that it took in, they call it phagocytosis. Another term you see from time to time is uh, penocytosis, and this is, means cell drinking. So you're gonna reach out with your cell membrane, and you're going to engulf a little bit of the liquid and anything that's dissolved in the liquid and you're going to bring it inside the cell. So penocytosis is a form of endocytosis. You're bringing it in and you've got fluid that may or may not have something that you want inside the cell. This is actually a picture of a clathrin coated pit and here's the actual picture of an actual cell membrane doing this endocytosis. And then here's a cartoon version showing the what the artist thinks it looks like. So on this, you have clathrin on the outside of the cell membrane in high concentration. And in this case, it's absorbing 
low density lipoproteins or what the doctors and technicians like to call bad cholesterol. So LDL, low density, bad cholesterol. If it's so bad, why do we have a mechanism in our cell that specifically gathers it up? So here it is coming in, coming in, and attaching. And then here's the cell membrane dipping down and then pinching off. And now it has a nice bag full of low-density lipoprotein because we need it in our cells. We just don't need a whole lot of it. One of the things that I urge you to do to help you put a lot of this chapter into your mind is think about all the things that you do. You eat, you grow, you excrete, you breathe. Um, all of the things that you do, how does a cell that is one cell big, do all the same things that you do. If you go through all the organelles and you compare them with all of your body systems, you're going to find that it helps you understand and helps you remember what the various parts of the cell are. So, for example, if you're going to poop, we have this whole process of eating food, going down your stomach, going through your intestines, you absorb the nutrients out of it, and then what's left over, the indigestible fibers, the E. coli, other bacteria, and uh, some yeast, other odds and ends, are going to pass out in your feces. So that's how you do it. But if you're one so big, you don't have all that. You don't have a stomach. You don't have all that stuff. So what you do is you bring stuff in through endocytosis. So that would be your equivalent of a mouth. Whatever it is can travel through the endoplasmic reticulum. So that might be your um, transport system, like your bloodstream, where you've absorbed the nutrients. If you fuse whatever it is, say it was a bacteria that you brought in through endocytosis or phagocytosis. You need to dissolve it. How do you dissolve it? Well, you go get one of those lysosomes that's a bag full of digestive enzymes, and you fuse with it. So the lysosome is kind of like your stomach and like your intestines, where you have the, the enzymes that break down your food. So now I have a bag of digested uh, bacteria and I need to get that out through the cell membrane and out into the cytoplasm where I can use it. So they use the wall of the um, vesicle, the, the endocytotic vesicle that fused with the lysosome to act kind of like your intestines. So it's just going to pass out of the vesicle and into the cell, into the cytoplasm, where it can be used. And then the waste that you don't want, you don't have an anus, you don't have a rectum, you don't have a large intestine inside of a cell. So you're just going to take the bag and anything that you didn't digest, anything that you don't need, you're just going to take it over to the cell membrane and you're going to empty it outside the cell membrane. So this cartoon I thought was kind of funny because it says, uh oh, which one of you released a vesicle? So obviously the vesicle that they were doing exocytosis was one that had something that was a bit smelly inside. So go through and think about breathing. How does the cell breathe? Well, gases freely go through a diffusion gradient into the cell and waste gases freely leave the cells. So they diffuse right through the cell membrane. So you don't need to have lungs. You don't need to have a diaphragm. You just let it diffuse across. So think of all the things that you can do in your body and figure out how what organelles does the cell use to do the same function. 
So here we have the cartoon version, and here's an actual electron micrograph picture of a cell pooping or releasing something. Maybe it's just releasing some hormones or some proteins, but I think it's pooping. Here's another picture taken to an electron microscope. And this part right here is the inside of a capillary. So the capillary is the tiniest of all your blood vessels. And its walls are one cell thick. So here's one cell right here. You, only, you don't see the whole thing. And here's another cell that it's bumping up against. If you look, there's stuff in the, in the capillary that I need to get to the tissue. In this case, it happens to be some muscle tissue over here. So what I can do is I can pinch some of this plasma, this fluid that's in the capillary. I can pinch it off. So you see all of these places where you pinch it off. And this is penocytosis, where you're getting fluid and pinching it off. And then you send it across and release it so that the muscle can take it in. So endocytosis, exocytosis, and then endocytosis again. So it's passed from cell to cell so that you get what you need from one place to the other. So they call it transcytosis or across the cell. Some exocytosis is not as benign as the little picture I showed you before where the cell was releasing waste to the outside. This happens to be a cell that is releasing by exocytosis the AIDS virus. So look at all these AIDS viruses coming off. Here's one that's just about to push its way out. And a lot of viruses, as they come through the cell membrane, will actually take a little bit of the cell membrane and cover themselves up with it. So when the immune system is looking, it sees the outer cell membrane. It goes, oh, that's okay. That's, that's you. That's who you are. And it doesn't see the virus that's hiding underneath it. I'm going to pause here and I'm going to come back in part three and talk a little bit more about each of the organelles and what function it has in your body.